gentlemen, welcome to our next in our series of CEL Roundtable webinars hosted by the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. And I say good morning to you all. It is morning on this side of the world, but we have Shannon in Los Angeles where it's about midnight or a little after midnight there. So anyway, our webinars over the next two days, today and Wednesday, May 6th at 11 a.m. Dubai time, are titled World Review of Operations and Solutions beyond COVID-19. So what we're talking about is trying to get people more organized in their thought processes about what are the opportunities and the, the solutions that are out there. We're focusing on the responsibilities and the successful actions of the retailers and the shopping center owners reopening in the coming days, weeks, and months around the world. Our intent is to provide you with real stories which enable you to take action yourselves as we reopen our businesses around the world. Our experts with us today will focus on the new role of the shopping centers and the retailers, furthering our discussion on the liability, obligation, burden, authority, duty, and trust to our customers. So it, there's a lot going on here and it's gonna be interesting to hear how things are going in the other corners of the world. The Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers represents over a thousand retailers 875 shopping centers and over a thousand engaged members. We've been with you for 26 years and our role is to help you to facilitate your business and to assist you to raise your personal and professional profiles locally, regionally, and globally. Our funding is generated with networking events, certificate education programs, and conferencing. And as you know, we are now unable to host these events as we have in the past and our funding has evaporated. However, we continue to represent the retail and the shopping center industry and look forward to continuing for another 25 years in our service. But I wanna personally thank those businesses which have contributed to our financial well-being recently, and that's in the last couple of months. We really appreciate your support during these times. It makes it a lot easier for us to carry on. We are providing our webinars free of charge, however, if you want to contribute to our organization. For 100 Durham's, we'll provide you with a certificate of completion on our World Review Program for these two webinars. I also want to thank the Dubai Association Center for it's also provided their generous support to our members and team to help us spread the word around the, the Middle East, the Western and Central Asia, and also in Eastern Asia. So thank you to the Dubai government for that. For those in the industry who have lost their jobs, we are offering a free one-year membership to our organization, the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers, to assist those in your time of need to get up and running successfully back in the industry. And we've had probably about 25 to 30 people recently join us at our cost, which is for you, to help you get back into the industry and to get on your feet. Our team is here for you. You just need to reach out to us in any of our many platforms through our email, LinkedIn, voice on demand, retail podcasts, our webinars like today, our video on demand, YouTube video channels. And of course, I mean, you can always just use the phone. Let me introduce our experts today who have joined us to help us understand what the rest of the world in the retail world is busy doing from Los Angeles, Sweden, and Moscow. First of all, Magnus Roxner is a partner and COO at Safe Shopping Centers in Sweden, in Stockholm. And Magnus, thank you for joining us today. His experience ranges from developing, managing, and operating shopping centers and mixed-use projects from the Nordic countries, Russia, and the UAE. As COO of Safe Shopping Centers, Magnus advises industry organizations, asset managers, and owners in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa on risk and resilience framework, operational risk strategies, and operational accidents. Thank you, Magnus, for joining us. I also wanted to introduce from Los Angeles, Shannon Quilty has been in the retail business for over 20 years. She's focused on shopping center management from super regional shopping centers, community shopping centers, and boutique luxury projects, including one in Rodeo Dive and Beverly Hills. With uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, JLL, she's currently busy with them in the LA market. 
And Shannon has enjoyed global success in markets ranging from Istanbul, Russia, and North America. She's a great source of knowledge in the industry and has taught with us in our GVS education programs in Dubai, as well as other programs around the world. The power of positive customer experience to build loyalty, drive traffic, and increase sales performance is her specialty. Thanks for being with us today, Shannon. And then lastly, from Moscow, Michael Ruckman joins us with over 20 years experience in the real estate banking markets from the USA, Russia, Spain, and over 30 other countries around the world. Michael is a world leader in delivering business strategies and fully transforming organizations globally. Customer experience, brand loyalty, relationship management, delivering business model transformations are his specialty. We have enjoyed Michael as an educator at our GVS education programs last year, and we look forward to working with Michael and his team at Centio going forward to work with programs with us at the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailers. Please welcome Michael to our CEO roundtable this morning. And um, Magnus, let's go to you first in Sweden, in Stockholm. And I know that uh, things are a little different in Sweden because there's been a little different strategy globally with Sweden. Please fill us in and take the floor. It's all yours. Thank you very much, David. Well, as you may have heard, Sweden has, uh, I guess, together with Belarus as the only other country in Europe, a slightly different approach to uh, the, the corona uh, situation. So basically what has happened in Sweden is that we, don't, we, have ha we haven't had any lockdown or, or strict uh, restrictions. Rather, we, there has been recommendations uh, and there has been a lot of uh, trust in, in the individual taking the right decisions and so on. So basically the only restrictions that we have had so far is the maximum of 50 people gathering at the same time. Uh, we're encouraged, encouraged to do social distancing and so on. Uh, apart from that, we've had a few specific restrictions for, for restaurants uh, and so on. And the, the entire idea behind it is, is protect the risk group, but try to ke keep society and, and the citizens and so on keep on living in one way or another. Um, now, some, some people have interpreted that, that you know, life is as normal in Sweden. It's not, let me assure you that. So uh, um, we have a lot of people you know, self-distancing and so on. And just looking at some figures, uh, during April, we had approximately 40% of, of the workforce in Sweden was working remotely from home. Um, if you look at traveling patterns, for example, during the Eastern holidays, where is, which is a big uh, traveling holiday in Sweden, basically traveling from Stockholm was down with more than 90%. So there is a lot of things happening, although we are not you know, forced to do it by law. Um, uh, and we also see a lot of uh, you know, uh, compliance checks from the authorities and so on. We have had a few restaurants in the last couple of weeks that have been forced to close down because they are not living up to the standard when it comes to distancing and so on. Uh, and I think that although you know, uh, we cannot really translate the, the situation in Sweden to, to maybe all other countries, we can at least get some kind of indication of you know, how the customer is, is operating in for us during the, the, the pandemic, but for other countries, maybe when we start opening up. Um, and j just some other figures, just to, you know, to prove my point here that, that things are not as normal. Um, looking at, you know, retail sales, uh, the brick and mortar sales has dropped somewhere between 70 to 90% year on year, depending a little bit, you know, what category you're working in. And that obviously is partly due to that people are staying home and partly also because there is a big, financial uncertainty at the moment, that people are tending to, to save their money rather than to spend it. Uh, looking at uh, you know, uh, bankruptcy forecast for the industry, we're, we're seeing a double um, amount of forecasted bankruptcies for the retail side and triple for restaurant and hospitality during April. So there is a lot of things happening. Um, looking at footfalls in the, in the shopping centers, they are around 30 to 40 percent of the normal figures. Uh, and we also have a lot of uh, discussion going on, especially on social media, about you know, the, the feeling safe, so to speak. Uh, you see that, that there is a lot of discussions going on to which place to go to shop to, uh, where they have good uh, regimes for you know, making sure that there's a safe and, and healthy experience. Uh, and people 
really, really start choosing their, their uh, place of shopping depending on what kind of restrictions and well, self-imposed restrictions, that is, uh, and uh, uh, organization they have in place to make sure that it's a safe experience. Um, so that is, that is a little bit, you know, about, about Sweden. So it's, it's not what it used to be. There is a lot of things that's happened. Just looking out, you know, uh, around Sweden a little bit, you know, in Europe, uh, to, to broaden the, the view a little bit, we see that, you know, there is many countries right now in, in Central Europe, such as Germany and Austria, they have already started to trade, uh, partially at least, uh, with varying restrictions imposed on them, and which is basically the same as you have in, in the, your region. So they vary from, you know, facial mask size of the store that you can operate, people per square meter, temperature screening, uh, additional cleaning regimes and stuff like that. Uh, and what we see from the, the Central Europe, when they have started to trade, footfall there approximately 30 to 50 percent of the normal. Um, so same thing there that we see, uh, you know, a, a big uh, drop in the footfall. Um, now starting from today and moving forward throughout May, we will have gradually Europe being opening up. Um, I think today we have Poland start trading. We see Italy is uh, losing the restrictions right now, even if they are not really starting to trade yet. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if we look at an incubation period of two to 14 days of the virus, I think the coming few weeks will be really, really interesting to see what is happening uh, when it comes to the spread and also what will happen if we start picking up again on, on, the, uh, on the infected uh, individuals. Will someone revert back to lockdown or will we be able to, be able to stay open? Um, I think the biggest questions right now, um, as far as I understand, is UK where the last figure I saw was that we have, they're only 17% in favor for actually start easing up on the restrictions. So I think they are kind of the, the, the place where we have the, the biggest uh, reluctancy right now to, to move to something different. Um, looking at the, the, the risks that we have seen, just you know, to touch a little bit what we are doing normally, um, there, there is some indication that, you know, we have increased uh, shoplifting and petty theft. Uh, we have seen some, some, you know, deliberate coughing attacks and stuff like that happening. Um, in some cases, we have seen that, uh, that, you know, when things go back to normal, we also start behaving normal. And that means that we're starting to question and protest and so on. So we've had some protests. Uh, in uh, Germany, Austria, and so on. In some cases, not in Europe though, but in Hong Kong, for example, it has spilled over to the, to the shopping malls. Um, so that is one thing that we are looking for, obviously. Um, and I think also one of the, the, maybe the biggest risk for us is, is that we are not uh, able to gain the trust of the visitors and authorities and, and get the visitors back to the malls. Because right now we are in a, in a situation where I wouldn't say everything, but a, but a lot of things is, hap is, uh, is about trust at the moment. To actually gain the trust and also being able to maintain it. Um, and then of course, you know, what is happening now with, with the opening up of different countries, will we be able to keep the pandemic under control or will it explode again and resulting in renewed lockdowns or kind of panic restriction being, being imposed on us from the authorities? So that I think is, is kind of the, the outlook from, from where I'm sitting right now. Well, thank you very much, Magnus. It gives us a good idea on what's going on there. It's different than what I had expected. So thank you for that. Thank you. Shannon, how about uh, Los Angeles? What can you tell us there, Shannon? Well, um, we are actually, we're under a stay at home order in the state of California. So uh, kind of like Sweden in one way, we're, uh, the governor of California is taking a very um, methodical approach to doing any kind of reopening. And we are under stay at home until the 15th of May. And frankly, I think that, that that's already been extended up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I think it will be extended down here as well another two weeks. Um, in the meantime, of course, everything is closed with the exception of essential retail and, of course, that's grocery stores and, and uh, uh, large scale, you know, pharmacies and the like. We do a lot of, a lot of Uber Eats and a lot of, uh, a, a lot of DoorDash and things of that nature. Uh, but the, the, yeah, the retail is, non-essential retail is pretty much non-existent. Uh, I'm working on a project, as David said, um, with JLL in, in Los Angeles, and it was just a relaunch. 
and <laughs> they were trying to launch it and they just the whole thing got squashed by this so there there's a lot of issues we've been spending a lot of time on uh, rent deferral programs and talking with each and every uh, tenant individually to discuss what their needs are whether or not uh, we have a um, uh, if, if we can help them or if actually there is no help and, and we need to just let them go. So we're trying to remain empathetic as landlords, uh, also understanding what we need to do. We're also keeping an eye on co-tenancy issues. That's, that's another issue for us that's, uh, that's pretty big. So um, we're making changes to the services that we receive so we can save money in the meantime. So for example, we have a, a great number of restaurants in the project that I'm working on. And uh, when they're not open or they're not serving full time, then you can certainly cut down on your waste management and things of that nature. So we're trying to make those changes. Um, for the rest of the country, you know, Georgia has, has reopened. Um, Simon Properties has announced that they're going to open in a phased approach of, I, I think they've, they're they going to try to roll them out. They were going to do five the first week of May and then continue to roll them out as uh, states and, and local areas uh, open up. And so they have, they have a big protocol. Uh, if you go to their website, everything is very transparent. They're telling you everything that you can expect and everything that they're doing. And I think that's what we're going to need to do. And I'll talk about that a little bit further about being transparent about what we're doing in order to make our customers comfortable. Uh, but I think that's the first major mall that's going to be reopening. So we'll keep an eye on that and see, see how it works. Um, but I would encourage all of you, since it's right there, take a look at what they've got uh, on their website because it's, it's interesting stuff and it can certainly help you. As for when we're going to reopen and how that's going to look, uh, we'll see. <laughs> I, mean, I think I think we have a great number of opportunities here, and um, well, anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit further. Okay, thanks very much. That's great, Michael. How about in Moscow? Uh, Moscow is kind of interesting right now. <laughs> they, uh, I mean, you, you may have noticed the, the numbers that they were reporting were extremely low compared to the rest of the, the planet. Uh, however, uh, we were seeing on social media every day lines of sometimes hundreds of ambulances waiting to get to hospitals that were full. Um, and so it really put a tax on the healthcare system. And then they kind of tricked everybody indoors. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they said, well, everybody gets a week off and it's paid. Don't worry. Just relax. Everything will be back to normal soon. Uh, that was the, the last week of March. Uh, then they said, well, uh, no, we should probably keep this until the end of, of April. And so everybody kind of went, okay, well, we're already inside and we've already stocked up on food and toilet paper. I, don't, I still don't understand the thing with toilet paper, to be honest. My, my first order was wine uh, and the second was meat. So <laughs> I, I really, really didn't get the whole, the whole memo on, on why you need to order so much toilet paper. Uh, but uh, so they, we've been inside now for, for us, it was uh, 16th of, of March. We decided that we were sending everybody home and that we would work remotely. Uh, the official was a week later when they asked everybody to go home. Uh, retail shut down, uh, everything shut down except for non-essential. Uh, we have uh, one client that's a luxury retailer and I, I was going to talk about that a, a little bit today because um, uh, we, I mean, luxury retailers are, are really struggling uh, unless, you've, unless you've got, you know, luxury pajamas. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're, not, they're not selling much these days. And uh, I always say, you know, I've been through multiple crises with, with uh, different clients and, and managing our own company through crises and so on. And I always say the biggest mistake that people make in times of crisis is not to identify and prepare for the opportunities coming out of a crisis. And so this is one of those things where, you know, I, I try to work with clients and with our own company to say, okay, stabilize, but let, let's also be aware of what's happening around us. And let's use this time of uncertainty to test and learn and prepare for the new model. Because the, the idea that we're all going to go back to uh, you know, like tomorrow, everybody's going to say, hey, everybody's back, nothing to worry about, everything will be the way it was two months ago, and, and so on. The idea that that's going to happen is almost ridiculous. So there's, there's going to be some new normal, 
uh, everybody is learning to purchase online, which is going to be a huge factor of commoditization for, for offline retailers uh, because it's so easy to be online and compare. And we've got time, uh, so to, to have the time to compare and, and find the lowest price thing. And if I know I get it cheaper over there, then I'm, I'm going to buy it there. Even if it requires a little bit of extra time for me on the internet, it's still not the same as the old model of, you know, driving across town to get something 5% cheaper. Uh, it's much easier over the internet. And so now we've, we've got people that are uh, making purchases online that never did that before. And the people that were shopping online are, are shopping more online. And this is going to have a huge impact on offline retailers. And, and if they, they aren't doing something today, for example, well, the, the example that I've been using for the last couple of weeks is if you, if you take a, a Louis Vuitton store uh, or any premium retailer for that, for that matter, but, but Louis Vuitton is just a, a fun example. So if you, if you take the experience when you go into a Louis Vuitton store, you've got the kind of over the top service and attention that you get. You've got a, a cup of cappuccino or a glass of champagne and you know, the, the, the sensory engagement of being in there, the smell, touching the fabric, touching the shoes, you know, sitting in the comfortable chair, everything. There's a certain experience to it that almost, almost justifies the price, almost. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, if you, if you take that same Louis Vuitton experience online, it's, it's absolutely flat. Uh, in terms of emotionally and emotion, emotional and sensory engagement, you've got almost nothing. And in, in most cases, they haven't even put pictures of real people in. You've just got the item. So one of the opportunities, I think, and I was just going to toss this out there for a discussion today, is there's a company called LuxLock uh, that's actually doing this already online. Uh, they, they do almost like a one-on-one -on -one personal shopping over video uh, for luxury brands. So why wouldn't Louis Vuitton, in times of while well, sales are down, uh, take people back to the stores and have their best clients over WhatsApp or WeChat or whatever, uh, just do a one-on-one -on -one video and walk through the store and say, hey, this sweater goes with these jeans and you should look at this new bracelet because it's you know, similar to other things you bought and so on. And so why not do that now? They'll pull back some of the sales that they're, that they're missing, but they can also test a new model. And maybe coming out of this, they refine that model a bit and, and engineer it into a new format that they don't have today, because today they have online offline, uh, but maybe in the future they can have some hybrid format where they, they have almost like a home shopping network type studio that's broadcasting these luxury kind of images and lifestyle scenarios and so on. And somebody raises a hand and says, hey, I'd like an individual consultation. And they split them off and go to a one-on-one a -on -one kind of video personal shopper. And then maybe they've got, you know, maybe there's one kind of broadcast hub in each country, uh, but they have logistics centers in, in all the major cities where they can dispatch a courier with the items that were chosen. And they can even stop on the way and grab a cappuccino or, or a split of champagne to kind of <laughs> uh, mimic the same offline experience. And then they could, they, the courier could wait outside and uh, while the person's trying everything on and they give back the things they don't want and boom, purchase is made. And now coming out of the crisis, they've got this new hybrid model. So as again, the only thing I wanted to say is, and we're, we're working with this luxury retailer here right now on this concept, because we're saying, listen, yeah, it's painful, uh, but let's use this time to, to learn and to kind of refine some new models that are going to bring more opportunity coming out of this. So that, that's my spiel and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. And it, it makes sense too, because there is always a time for opportunity in the midst of all of these headaches. So I think you're, you're right on with that idea. And I like your idea of hybrid, uh, the whole hybrid uh, retail idea. So well, thank you, you know, for we've that. Been doing, we've been doing this for years in, in other industries uh, to enhance an online experience or to, to bring back that human context, the, the, the social context, the human contact, all of that. Um, and it just, for some reason, hasn't happened in retail, but there's a, a, a massive opportunity to test this and come out with a new model now. And it is a great time to do that. I mean, there is time. We, yeah. That's the one thing that we find that we have a luxury of a little bit is time these days. So it's great. Magnus, has there been anything new in Sweden, in Stockholm in particular, that you could say has, there's a, there's a new niche that's opened up? Anything you can suggest there? Uh, I think, uh, you know, what, what Michael is saying, you know, we see a lot of different uh, kind of new innovations that is coming up, uh, both when it comes to, you know, how we're dealing with, with uh, staff and so on. We see a lot of cooperation between maybe hospitality and uh, um, uh, grocery side and so on that we, we're kind of 
using each other's people for the time being to make sure that you know everyone is, has has a job to go to. Uh, but we also see different uh, uh, new initiatives when it comes to the retail side. As you said, we have this kind of interactive personal shopper where we're using uh, basically FaceTime to to do a. Uh, a personal shopping experience we have seen that um, but but in other, otherwise I would say that you know uh, we see what we're trying to push things over to to uh, to e-commerce as well uh, but but the figures we're seeing right now from Sweden is not that you know e-commerce has you know lifted off uh, tremendously we are stable on roughly 10 percent of, of uh, the, the total retail sales and uh, the only the only two markets actually we're seeing that you know is picking up is pharmacy and, and grocery uh, so that is what we're seeing up here okay thank you and then shannon in los angeles do you have anything uh, new that you can report that's a new trend uh, something online that's uh, different well i don't know that i would go go um that far yet because I think, uh, well, you know how hard it is to get this industry to innovate. Um, we really, but the, but the thing we've been talking to our clients about is, uh, is about something we're calling, we call safety theater. And it was actually coined by uh, Joe Pine, the author of The Experience Economy. And, and his theory you may know is, is that, you know, retail is theater. And so your re so this is called safety theater because the stay at home orders are lifted and we go about reopening and, and our restaurants and, and retail, uh, we have to, it's, it's more important than ever that we put together the processes and the protocols. And this is what we should be using this time for now, if you haven't yet reopened. I know in Dubai, you have uh, shopping centers that have reopened in Bahrain and, and some of the other uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, and that'll be really interesting to see what they're doing. But what, what we're talking about is that it's not going to be enough just to know that you've got the process and the protocols. You need to, um, you need to put on the show because perception is so important. People need to see the sanitizing station outside of the door. They need to see that the doors now open automatically. So like, for example, if you enter, this is kind of how I foresee it. And I, I, I had spoken to a woman who had gone to a restaurant in Georgia, same day they, they opened everything up. And uh, so it was interesting. She said, you know, first off, you had to make a reservation, no walk-ins. Okay. So then you get there and imagine you, you enter the restaurant, you see a hand sanitizer station just right there before, as you approach the front door, before you even go in, the front door opens automatically. And then the host is at the podium wearing a mask, likely branded, imagine that. And then <laughs> let's just say Arby's right over, oh, hopefully not Arby's, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and so now she's going to take you to a table. The tables are all empty. There's you know no setup as normal. And as you approach, you're seeing the busser. He's absolutely beautifully resplendent in a white shirt, white slacks, black apron, something like that. So he, he brings the impression of being clean. And he is disinfecting your table and your chairs prior to your sitting down. And he's, he's like, finish just as you get there. It's so beautiful, seamless. And then, and then your waiter comes over and he has for you, or he or she has for you, uh, a sealed bag that's going to have your utensils, your salt and pepper, uh, your menu, or maybe even you order from the menu before you even arrive there. And maybe you even pay for it from your computer prior to arriving. That's a possibility as well. And so you do this, you're having your meal, you can see the people in the back in the big open kitchen, and now they're wearing full on hazmat suits. <laughs> Looks like something out of ET. And then maybe not quite that extreme, but you get my, you get my point. Uh, so you've got, you know, masks and gloves and your waiter takes your touchless payments and perhaps you've already paid via the app. And then you sail out of there with, uh, hand sanitizer on the way out and they're cleaning everything up. Maybe your plate comes with something over it so you feel like it, it, it was more safe underneath it. But that's just sort of an idea of what we might be able to see in, in restaurants as they become more open. Um, well, we also need to understand. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, we've, um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion in this region about payment, whether it's cash or whether it's card. And yeah. I know that there's been a movement uh, to have uh, touchless payment. So you just flash your card in front of the POS 
and you don't even need to put in your pin. So they've even raised the, uh, the limit that you need to put in your pin number. So they're trying to really get around the whole idea of having to leave your card in somebody else's hands or insert it into the machine or these kinds of things. So. Right, pressing buttons and the like. Yeah, exactly. And you know, actually Michael and I have a former colleague who has uh, a face recognition um, uh, platform that she's she's beta tested. Michael, in, are they still were they still using it in Moscow at the yeah, uh, that, that's actually one of the one of the trends that I was going to mention here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, All right. You're stealing. You're stealing my story. <laughs> no, no, no. Go back to my story. So, so the other thing is we have to. One of the reasons why it's lots of reasons why it's important to make people feel comfortable uh, as quickly as possible. Um, people are not going to feel safe. They're they're going to want that extra uh, feeling of confidence that you're looking out for them and. Uh, and like I thought was interesting what Magnus said about uh, the fact that uh, their blogs talking about where people where, where you should go where you maybe shouldn't go where you know so even though they're not they're not locked down or under any kind of stay at home people are still very conscious of, of what they're doing. So anyway, uh, this morning consult did a survey a very small survey about only 2200 people but they did it April 7th between April 7th and April 9th. And which for me is, I would say that's like the first phase. We're still in the hoarding phase, right, <laughs> of, of retail of, of, uh, of the virus. And uh, so it turned out when they asked when they thought, they asked these people when they thought they'd feel comfortable coming back into the shopping center environment, 24% said it's going to take me six months to or more before I'm going to feel comfortable. 16% said 3% or more, and then there are 4% who are already there waiting by the doors to go in. So that's pretty remarkable. And when 20, 24, a quarter of, of the people spoking, that they spoke with said six months or longer. So the sooner we can, we can create these processes and protocols and put them in place so that people can see them and feel comfortable, the better, better off we'll be. And so during this forced time out, you know, we should use this time to do, to refresh our places. So for example, you know, sit back and take a look at your premises. How's it look? Does it need a touch up of paint? Does it need like a sprucing up here? And you're going to be moving things around now to, to, to uh, suit the new, uh, I don't know if paradigm's the right word, but how, how people are going to be in the space. So let's take a look at just the little things you can do to really spruce up your space and make it look cleaner and fresher. So that's one thing. And then you want to redesign your offer and make sure that it is suited to the new needs of your clients and, and customers. And then you also want to, you know, do some reformatting of, of that space and of your offer and does shopping centers in particular, and I know Michael's going to touch on this, uh, is about how we're going to have to reformat some things, not just operationally, um, but um, all, all encompassing, really. So um, that's kind of the thing right. that we have. To, I, I just really feel like the, the important thing, and, and Michael and I, I know we agree on this, is that let's take this time that we have and, and really use it to discover new ways of doing business because this isn't going to be the same old, same old. Okay, and I agree, that's well said. I, I appreciate what you're saying. Michael, you had a couple of other thoughts you wanted to, uh, and one was contact less payment. Something yeah, like yeah, so there, there's a business here that they, they started a couple of years ago um, and they were just, uh, they just sold a stake to uh, the, the biggest mobile operator in the country. Um, but they started doing, it's called selfie to pay. Uh, so basically it's face recognition software and it goes next to a cash register and you just look at it. And as long as you've configured the app on your phone uh, to, for certain types of payments, then, you know, they put the, the transaction in and you just look at this thing and it processes the payment. So it's really, it's really kind of interesting. But I think between uh, uh, new technologies like that, or, or let's say semi-old technologies like Apple Pay, Google Pay, Android Pay, things like that, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for contactless payment. And I don't think, I think this may be uh, the, the end of cash uh, for, for at least a while. I mean, cash is, is uh, pretty dirty 
uh, thing. We were talking about that in terms of um, one of the trends here is that there was a huge rush, rush of uh, food delivery um, in, let's say, the first two, three, four weeks of, of this lockdown. And now it's actually weaning off. And the more people that I talk to, they say, well, we just don't trust it anymore. And going back to this concept of theater, you know, you've got people in a kitchen, the unknown, you know, the unknown uh, creates fear. So you got people in a kitchen somewhere. We don't know if the kitchen is sanitary, if people have gloves on and masks and so on. Um, there's a, a supermarket client of ours here that it's, it just happens to be the supermarket where I shop. And then I, I go back and I talk to the management and I say, well, you know, the masks really don't do anything if everyone has the mask below their nose. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, still, and okay. they're still talking to you and breathing while they're packing your food and so on. But then they have the cashiers with these like masks like on and yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're like almost in a, in a metal suit, you know, <laughs> so to speak. But the people preparing your food have a mask on and then they pull the glove off and hand you the package with no glove. And so that, that the, what Shannon was touching on with this concept of, of uh, safety theater, you know, Joe Pine says, uh, work is theater and your business is a stage. Um, so, you know, using, and actually, by the way, I'll do a, a, a little plug of our, we have a video series on YouTube right now, if anybody wants to find it. Um, there, we've, we've done a number of different video series. They're kind of five, six, seven minutes each. And the latest one is with Joe Pine. So we're, we've got a new module posting every couple of days. Um, but it's really about surviving and thriving in, in this, this time. So with Joe, we did surviving and thriving in the experience economy. And really this whole concept of the experience economy is how do we use emotional engagement to create a memorable, memorable experience? Well, if we're dealing with fear, uh, fear is a, a, a crippling emotion. It's a, it's a, a crippling kind of uh, element in, in any purchasing pattern. So delivery, I think, has fallen off because you've got this image of who's in the kitchen and what's this delivery guy doing and did he take a cash tip from my neighbor or the guy before me and now he's got virus on his hands and he's touching my food and handing it to me and how do we sterilize the food? We, we, we were joking the other day, but we've got this process of anything that comes into our house, it gets all laid out and we spray it down and we leave it there for an hour. <laughs> and then we then we spray it down again and now it's been accepted into our environment <laughs> it's just kind of uh funny but i, I think there's a, a a lot of these uh, changes in behavior that that they're definitely not going to come back quickly uh so there and there's some good out of this which is you know uh moving away from paper money and getting into into digital and contactless it's it's uh, it's our future we might as well embrace it now and one of the things that I'm going to talk about on Wednesday is what I'm calling the, the grand strategy for shopping center reformats. Uh, so I think if we, if we take a, a bit of a sober look at how behavior is changing right now, we can already guess uh, what shopping centers need to look like uh, in, in, at the end of this. So in a year or two years. And I'll talk about that in more depth on, on Wednesday because I think it's an interesting it's an interesting exercise to look at your shopping center today and look at what it probably should look like two years from now and say, hey, maybe right now while we don't have all the traffic is a great time to start reformatting <laughs> or, at least, yeah. or at least start preparing for this so that you're ready for it. Well, that's a good point and thank you. And by the way, on your um, other webinars that you've done in your Incentio in your own company, mm -hmm. we've already, I believe, and I could check with my team, but I think we've already linked those to our website so that oh, they're great. available. So we're great. happy to share those. And I know that when they came in, similarly, Magnus sent us some information a while ago too on opening checklists. And we've certainly attached those to our, our website as well. So Perfect. I really appreciate that, Michael. And Thank you. Very Thank much you. On that. I yeah. appreciate it. Um, now, we have a couple of questions that I see. Who on the team of the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retail is handling the questions? Hi, David. Good morning. Hi, um, Justin. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Do we have questions? Great. Yes, we do. Um, all right. So we're starting our question and answer portion. And the first question that we have is from Rob Gaunt. Okay. Rob, go ahead. First of all, my apologies. My, my camera's not working. So um, it's, That's okay. It's, we can hear you uh, loud no, and clear. We can hear you loud I, and clear. It's all good. Good. Um, it's actually building on what Michael was saying. We've been having some very interesting conversations uh, here in South Africa. And really, our approach has been based upon the fact that we believe that, uh, that shoppers uh, and their experiences currently are, um, are fairly binary. You know, with book, book readers, you have uh, 
people that um, love the smell of books and the tactile side of it. And these would ideally be the, or technically be the, the shoppers that enjoy the shopping mall experience of walking down the, the, the malls and experiencing the tactile experience. The second uh, book readers are those that, that have the Kindle experience and read their Kindles. And then you, the third, third group is really those that enjoy the audio books. Well, in shopping, we generally have the, the, the two groups, um, which is the, those that walk down our malls and those that uh, um, do the online shopping. And we, we, we applied ourselves in trying to think about how we could, uh, we could in some way add, a, add an additional string to our bow by taking the resources we have under the constraints which we are placed under and finding a way of leveraging all of that and turning all of this into a, a force multiplier. And, and really the, the, the sort of direction that we found ourselves going in is that we've, we, we're starting to look at shopping centers as, as distribution centers more. And this doesn't mean that, that, that it takes away from their current, their current configurations, but what it does mean is that there's this additional layer to them where um, technically um, distribution centers are fairly uniform and, 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 and uh, simple in, their, in, in the offering that they, they, they give, uh, Amazon notwithstanding. But in terms of shopping centers, this allows for people to, to uh, have access to vast amounts of product across the board uh, in their, within their, their, their local areas. And we've discovered that our shoppers are very um, loyal to their local local shopping centres. They want to they want to shop there. They want to support uh, their their uh, uh, retailers. They know their retailers. They have a relationship with them. They know the layout of their shopping centres, etc. And so we've we've looked at the the uh, the possibility of uh, creating pop up environments within the parking lots instead of within the actual malls. Um, now, technically, you would, I mean, we all know the pop-ups, uh, the pop-up uh, environments that, that uh, we're, we're all used to for, for uh, temporary shops. But, you know, our, 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 our parking areas are areas of vast, they vast expanses. They, uh, tra they're designed to handle huge amounts of, of, of traffic. And the ability to pick product off shop uh, retail shelves and deposit them in a, in, a, in a simple area and building on what Michael was saying with regards to things like, uh, um, you know, cashless payments and so on. We're quite, quite a way down the road in, uh, in, in configuring a situation that is, is really, really very easily scalable. And uh, it allows for people to shop in their local shopping centers, drive to the shopping centers, go to a, a, a designated area, show the concierge, uh, which Shannon was, was uh, talking about somebody in, 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 in white, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, all cleanly dressed and so on, uh, but a concierge. I think we've lost you there, uh, Which is red and, uh, and uh, pick up their goods, pop their boot, pick up their goods and, uh, and, um, and, and go from there. And this is, uh, as I say, this is something which has been received very, very well, but it bears more conversation because we have context only as far as our local market is concerned, but we believe that it's something that is scalable and easy to, uh, easy to roll out. Thank you, Rob. Uh, those are great points and I appreciate you um, discussing them. I think uh, there are many different solutions and some of those that you have spoken about are gonna be very helpful. I know in this region, with the weather that we have here may not be as reasonable. And also, I guess it would depend on the other uh, countries as well as to how they would see it. But uh, yes, it Magnus, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, not, I mean, if we're looking in, in, in Sweden, this part of the world, I would say, I mean, our distribution networks and so on are, is pretty well uh, you know, established and, and uh, uh, with deliveries and so on. So, and I guess that, when it comes to, to uh, I spoke with some clients down in, in, uh, in Southeastern Europe uh, the other day, 
and discussing the, the possibility and moving and transferring a lot of, of the retail over to, to e-commerce instead. And there they have a challenge with, you know, kind of the, the, the distribution network, which is not really, not really there. So I think uh, that is also something to take into consideration. I would just like to, you know, add on to what, what uh, Michael and Shannon uh, discussed earlier as well with this risk theater, because that is something that we are, you know, seeing quite a lot as well. And when we're going into what, what we refer to some, some kind of transition period, because we are, we are not in the new normal yet, we are moving there, but we are, you know, somewhere in between maybe. Uh, and I think it's a very, very good example that, that you brought up, Michael, with, you know, uh, having the, the facial masks, you know, everyone has it, but it's here rather mm -hmm. than, you know, up above your nose. So, I mean, it's super important that we have the perception, the display and so on, that people feel safe to come into the shopping mall, but it's equally important that we have kind of the framework and, and, and compliance checks and so on behind it to make sure that we actually are using it in a good way. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think that, you know, what we have seen so far at least is that people have very, very, very little tolerance for mistakes at this time. They are mm -hmm. changing very, very quickly in their behavior. Yeah, you're right on that. Thank you. Justin, did you have any other questions for people? Um, at the moment, uh, we don't. Uh, but to anyone that and everyone who wants to uh, have a question, please raise your hand uh, by clicking the participant button below. Okay, thank you. So, Michael, I was going to go back to you and ask another question for you. Mm -hmm. the, the new normal of um, shopping in Moscow, what do you see that being in the next... Uh, sort of three months, two months and three months out? Wow, that, that is a, a good question. Cause I, I don't know, uh, I kind of have this feeling that if, if we're able to sit down in a restaurant and have a meal before the end of summer, it'll be, it'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I'm kind of a, a bit pessimistic on the whole reopening of things. And I think even, it, even if things do reopen, I, I kind of have a feeling there's gonna be minimal traffic. Um, everybody's kind of gotten used to cooking at home and buying things online and, and so on. And yeah, the desire to go out again is interesting, but I think until there's a, some kind of vaccine, uh, that fear is still gonna be an overriding uh, factor. So I think uh, offline retailers and shopping centers are gonna have to really explore uh, new ways of creating value for people in order to lure people back in. Um, and I've used this example with shopping centers uh, for years now. Uh, hopefully someday we'll, we'll see a, a, a good uh, version of it in real life. Uh, but I've said, you know, shopping centers have uh, always maintained a fairly passive role in the shopping experience. Mm -hmm. And it would be very interesting for shopping centers right now to explore doing something a little bit more active and engaging for people other than what we call hygiene factors. So making sure that it it's easy to find a parking space and that toilets are clean and that, you know, uh, navigational signage is in the right spots and, and uh, uh, trash cans are easy to find and so on. Uh, the, the hygiene factor really isn't enough anymore. And shopping centers have a unique opportunity to give people planning tools and, and help people to make cross retailer purchases. So, you know, if you, if you think about a, a particular life event, like, I don't know, having a baby or going on vacation or getting married or whatever, you need, uh, you need to make a lot of different purchases and they're not all within one retailer. And yeah. giving people simple tools to help create a checklist and, and a budget and a, a purchase calendar, maybe, maybe they can't make all the purchases in one time, but creating that environment uh, where people can plan for and realize their purchases. Again, this is another way of exploring uh, this hybrid between online and offline. You know, if I, if I do this in an, in an app, um, and maybe I can even use kind of augmented reality and my customer can hold up their phone and we can navigate them through the space based on the checklist of, of purchases that they need to make today. So there's a lot here of, I would say, new ways of creating value. And those are the things that are going to help retailers and shopping centers to lure customers back in faster. Um, and I think if they're not thinking about it today, they really should. <laughs> it's time. And now yeah. they have the time. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I see another uh, question, a hand raised. Is there, uh, do you have, go ahead. Yes. Um, we have uh, one question from Liju. Mm -hmm. Liju, please go ahead. Hi. Um, look, I, I was just wondering, say, you know, looking at the situation, uh, this could go on for a couple of uh, coming months. 
So are we thinking about uh, active surface disinfection? I mean, there are plenty of ways to do surface disinfection and air quality, even from the AHUs, the FAHU side. Um, is there any shopping centers who will make it a mandatory requirement? There are ways to check the air quality inside a shopping center. And there are simple, uh, you know, measuring tools and we can even show the customers what the, the, about the quality of air they are breathing. You know, there are many good products available in the market, uh, right from, you know, US to many other countries, including uh, G. G has got an active lighting system where it goes with the normal lighting, also uh, clubbed with, uh, you know, active UV lighting at uh, 256 uh, um, nanometers, which will actively kill any uh, gemicides uh, which are on the surface. Is, is it a discussion um, as a part of the ongoing uh, proposals or? Sure, let me start. And I think I'd like Magnus to follow up, but first let me explain about the UAE in the region. There's been significant um, cleaning, sterilizing of the shopping center and retail environments here in, in Dubai in particular and Abu Dhabi. And I think that people are quite, uh, quite knowledgeable now almost because they've been doing it so often. And I know, uh, Magnus, with your SAFE, your company called SAFE, you've been involved with a few things like this. Tell me what you know. Yeah, so, so basically, as you say, I mean, we see it everywhere right now with, you know, increased uh, cleaning, uh, both when it comes to, you know, kind of nighttime cleaning, but also increased cleaning during the daytime, especially, you know, high touch areas such as uh, uh, ATMs, uh, door handles and so on. Um, we see also a lot of new kind of new innovations coming up, you know, uh, uh, transforming doors that are manual to rather than having a normal handle that you open it with your elbow and so on and so on. Uh, so that is definitely coming. Uh, we also see, you know, starting to use a lot of this uh, kind of uh, um, antibacterial foils on, on handles and so on, which we can replace with a, with a, with a higher frequency and also, you know, helps to kill uh, any viruses that we have. When, when it comes to air handlers that, that you were talking about, uh, I think that, you know, the, the normal recommendation is to, to try to have ventilation going as much as possible and, you know, changing the filters frequently. Uh, UV treatment, as far as I have seen from the reports, the, the amount of UV lights that we need to actually treat all the uh, or the supplier that we're having coming in is uh, kind of almost un not doable in a shopping center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Shannon, is there anything you'd like to add on that uh, point that was raised by Liju? You know, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff that, that comes out of this um, different ways of looking at cleaning. So the UV, I think that's brilliant if that works. Um, but we'll have to be looking at that and what Magnus said about, you know, sliding doors and, and all of that. And also the online things. I think these were all places we may have been heading, but especially with the technology, these were all places that we may have been heading, but it's just been compressed into this little itty bitty time period. And, and so now rather than thinking we have all this time to think about how we can make it work or how it won't work or blah, 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 we, we have right now. Okay. And, and again, I'll go back to, let's take this time to make sure that we've given people a good reason to come back to the shopping center. You know, they, they need not just to feel safe, but that they also feel like um, there's a reason to be there beyond the transactional. I understand. Okay. Justin, I think there's another hand raised. Is there any, um, another yes. question? Um, before we uh, go to Hussein, uh, Rob Gant has uh, one point uh, before, uh, so go and ahead. then we'll go to Hussein. Hi, Rob. Okay. Hello. Oh, Hi, Rob. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Rob. there we go. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, I'll try and be brief. Uh, just to, to build on what um, Magnus was saying, um, I think I think that uh, with regards to my earlier point. Part of the conversation that we're having here is based upon the fact that we would like to put the transaction back into the store as opposed to putting the transaction further upstream. It's a, it's a big issue for us that stores are dying on the vine because transactions are being claimed via the e-commerce side of things by their brands further upstream. 
And so a large part of what our drive and our, our, our thought process is here is how to upscale the turnover within the shopping centers by facilitating a transactional environment that allows the shoppers to transact with those that they're familiar with, allow those that they're familiar with to benefit from that transaction and to allow Hi Rob, we lost you. Requirement for that conversation to take place. So that's a large part of how we're thinking at the moment. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's about giving the power back to the store within the shopping center, so that as I say, it doesn't die on the vine. So that's that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate your input, uh, Justin. You? Yes. Um, so for the next one, we have is Hussein Jamal. Okay. The same. How are you? Yes, fine. Greetings to all from the Sultanate of Oman. Nice to see all of you in the morning. You too. Um, I'm just wondering that, you know, what we've seen and heard over the past couple of months, uh, this, this pandemic is one of many more to come. I hope not, but, you know, this is something that we can foresee I mean, this is COVID, but, you know, uh, looking at the way it has spread. So do you think that this will trigger a development side of uh, how we design malls, uh, the entry, the exits, the way the air conditioning works, the way we allow people into the mall, dedicated entry, dedicated exits? I don't know. I mean, for a newer mall, maybe it's easier to retrofit, but I think it will have a, a tough impact on the older malls, the community centers where, you know, they may not have. So I think this is another aspect that I guess uh, mall developers for the future will, will be looking at, you know, how to safeguard themselves uh, uh, from okay. situations happening in the future. Good point. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that one, on the new... Uh layouts that we might have to see. Absolutely. Uh, this, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this as a plug for the webinar on Wednesday. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, uh, really what we're going to talk about on Wednesday is this kind of grand strategy for reformatting and, and what the changes in behavior that are happening now uh, will bring for, for shopping centers uh, in the future. And there are a lot of things like what uh, Rob said, and, and there are a lot of things that have been uh, let's say, looming over the shopping center industry for years. So how do we deal with percentage rent if a person walked into a store, tried something on, and then went home and bought it online? Uh, so, you know, the trend, and, and maybe the answer isn't trying to claw back the transaction to the center, but exploring new models that actually eliminate that problem. Um, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about on Wednesday. And I think there's going to be a lot of redesign for those, for those centers that are smart, uh, and they'll be using this time to actually start piloting new models, maybe without the massive investments of reformatting everything, but taking small pieces, reform, reformatting them, and seeing how they fit with new behavioral models as, as we're coming out of this. Uh, personally, I think this is gonna go on. I think this year is shot, <laughs> personally. Uh, I, I don't mean to be the, the pessimist, but I, I think uh, the reality of everything coming back to normal in a short period of time is, is very, very small. Um, and I think there are going to be major permanent changes in behavior for a large portion of, of people. And that's going to drive, it's, it's going to force uh, new models in the shopping center industry if they want to fill their spaces. Um, and it's going to be the types of things like creating new, new, new forms of value for people that are coming to that space. Um, and also eliminating some of the problems that have been in the shopping center model for a while, like the, you know, e-commerce cannibalizing the, the in-store in transactions and so on, and that affecting uh, percentage rent and the retailers aren't necessarily motivated to be transparent on that and so on. So a lot of these things can actually be resolved over the next year, two or three, um, if shopping centers are testing these new things now. And that, that's really what I'm going to talk about on Wednesday. Thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. And so we're a little bit past our time. Um, I wanted to start and say to the people, uh, thank you for all of the participants who have joined us today on this webinar. And I want to say that on Wednesday, again, same time, Dubai time, 11 a.m., uh, May 6th, come back and join us because today we are talking about more of what's going on today. But I think as Michael has alluded to, 
we're going to talk more about solutions that are coming forward and opportunities and niches that you could look forward as a shopping center owner and as a retailer to make a difference going forward. But um, let me start by thanking the team, the, the participants who came out there. I know the Middle East Council of Shopping Centers and Retailer team who have been busy putting this on, on the behind the house. Thank you on the back of house. I want to thank Shannon for spending her evening. It's now uh, probably one in the morning thereabouts. So thank you very much, Shannon, for joining us. Really appreciate your input. Great to see you. And one, Magnus, uh, thank you very much. Magnus Roxner from Sweden. I really appreciate seeing you again and listening to what's going on there. And we look forward to hearing more from you shortly as well. And then also uh, Michael Ruckman, thank you so much for being part of it again today. And thank uh, you. so that's it. And thank you one and all. And uh, we'll see you again on Wednesday at, ele at 11 a.m. Dubai time. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.